Ephesians chapter 5. We are going to be putting in the last teaching installment of our First Comes Love, Then Comes Marriage series. Everybody say, aw. All good things have to come to an end. Eventually, last week, our relationship status, if you'll remember, received an upgrade to being married. As we discuss the topic of leaving and cleaving, looking at God's design for marriage and how a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast and cleave to his wife and the two shall become one. We got to watch as our couple in Song of Solomon tied the knot and how they enjoyed their honeymoon night. And y'all can rest easy because we've made it through all the awkward, intimate stuff. We're not going back anymore, so... Take a deep breath. Some of you I know have suffered the past couple of weeks trying to make it through all that stuff, but we're good. You're in the clear now. No more of that ooey-gooey stuff going on tonight. So we got to see them enjoy those moments. Do me a favor. Close your eyes for a moment. I want you to, I want you to picture your wedding day. Let's use our imaginations as we get started tonight. Some of you are like, I'm going to have to really imagine because I'm just not sure that this is ever going to happen or not. But that's fine. Dive deep into your imagination. Picture that day. Ladies, imagine that day like it's the day that you've been waiting for. It's the day that every girl dreams of. You got up early that morning. You probably didn't really even have to get up because you probably didn't sleep at all the night before. But you got up early that morning and you've made it to the venue and you've got all your girlfriends around you and you're doing your makeup. And you're getting your dresses on. You're getting your hair did and all that good stuff. Pictures are being taken. Like everything's going perfectly, all the flowers are where they're supposed to be, the light setting's just right, the weather's just perfect, now comes a time where you're standing at the back of the room, the doors are closed, and all of a sudden they burst open, and you look up on that altar, and there is that hunky, gorgeous man that you have been looking for your entire life, waiting for you to come down the aisle, you make it down there, the ceremony is flawless, everything goes perfectly, guys. Use your imagination a little bit as well on this. I know you probably don't care as much, but you are looking forward to it. You get to the church early. You didn't sleep much that night either because whether you want to admit it or not, you're shaking in your shoes a little bit. There's a lot of nerves. There's a lot of anxiety. Why am I seeing so many eyeballs? We're imagining. Shut your eyes. You're surrounded with all your buds, man. You, you, you're you're high-fiving. You can't believe this moment's actually happened that you of all people actually found a woman that would tolerate your presence. You're standing in a miracle. You're getting ready with your buds. You're running here and there. You're taking all the pictures. You don't want to take any more pictures, but you're going to take more pictures. And then the moment finally comes. You're standing on the altar. The bridal parties come in. The doors are shut. And all of a sudden, they swing open, and there is that magical princess, the most beautiful woman you have ever seen in your life, making her way down the aisle, and you said you weren't going to cry, but you're crying. She makes it all the way down there to you. You have the ceremony. You have the kiss. Now you can open your eyes. We're at the reception. We're having a good time. Everything's gone smoothly. We're married now. Like the, the rest of our lives are before us. We're at that point where things are just getting started. This journey doesn't end with the ceremony. Marriage is so much more than just the wedding day and the honeymoon night. It's all that's in between the from this moment on until death do you part. It's building a life together. It's the starting of a family of your own. It's the ups and downs of life. It's the adversities that you'll face, the challenges you'll overcome, the joys that you'll share the memories that you'll etch, the lessons that you'll learn, the deeper love that you'll experience. Marriage is a shared adventure into one of life's greatest experiences that God permits us to enter into on this earth. But just like God has guidelines and expectations for how we are to live relationally outside of marriage, he also has guidelines and expectations for how we are to live relationally within our marriage. I do doesn't mean I'm done. There are still things within the marriage that we must honor God and his word in. And so, as we finalize this series tonight, I want us to get a handle on what God expects 
or really what God commands of us within our marriage as a husband or wife. And the most adequate place that we find that laid out is in Ephesians chapter 5. So in Ephesians 5, starting in verse 22, God's word reads, it says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Turn to somebody beside you and tell them it takes two. It takes two to make this thing go right. Marriage takes a combined effort for it to function properly. God has placed upon the wife certain roles and responsibilities. In the same way, God has placed upon the husband certain roles and responsibility. And it's important for us to understand what these roles and responsibilities are and how we function in them. So let me give you just a little pro tip right out of the gates. Marriage isn't 50-50. It's 100-100. You have to be all in at all times. It can't be us going into this saying, well, I'm going to do 50% my part. She's going to do 50% her part. We'll meet in the middle, and that will equal 100% of what we need. No, men, it is 100% of you fulfilling the responsibilities that God has laid out for you. Women, it is you 100% fulfilling the responsibilities that God has laid out for you. 100 and 100 equals 100. There has to be max effort to this at all times. So don't go into this thinking that, well, I'm going to find somebody to share my life with, and they're going to make up the empty half that I don't have. No, you're going to bring every bit of yourself into this, both of you, in full commitment to making this thing work in a way that honors God and follows God his guidelines for what our marriages are supposed to look like. I, uh, when I was a kid, I had a buddy that he actually lives not too far from this church where he grew up at. If you've been around here for any amount of time, you've heard this story before, but his name was JD and we used to love to ride bikes together. And so I was over at his house one day. Normally I would have taken my bike over there with me, but I didn't for whatever reason that day, which was fine because he put me on his sister's bike. It was a little girly looking, but, you know, we can roll with it. No big deal. And so we're going to take off. We're going to ride our bikes. They lived on a farm. And so their house kind of sat on top of a little bit of a, a hill, and on the down slope they had this big pasture, and they had a pond where their cows and their horses, their goats, all that would go in water. So at this time, they were in the process of expanding that pond. So what they had done was around the outside edge of the pond, they had dug a trench about 8 to 10 feet. And they were getting ready to knock a hole into that trench so the pond would flood over and fill in the extra space that they had dug out. And so we jump on our bikes. We're flying downhill towards the pond. We used to love to hang out around the pond, do guy stuff, you know, throw rocks at frogs or whatever. So we're going downhill just as fast as we can cut loose. It's like dirt and loose gravel. Like Everything's going fine for the moment. What my buddy J.D. had failed to tell me was that the brakes on his sister's bike didn't work. So downhill as fast as we can go, we're headed right towards the pond. And we get to that point where it's time to start like slowing down. And I start trying to, you know, slow down. That's when I figure out things are horribly wrong at this point. There's no brakes on the handles. There's no, like, back pedal brakes. There's no, there are no brakes whatsoever. So the only thing I know to do is to put my feet down and start trying to skid myself to a stop. So, like, we're skidding, you know, I've got, like, the whole 
handlebar wobble and everything. Like, I'm doing the best that I can. We're getting closer and closer to the edge. I get right to the edge. I finally get myself stopped this close to the edge. And my momentum is just a little bit too much. So in like what literally looked like a slow motion fall, I just tipped over. Straight down, 8 to 10 foot drop, the first thing that hit the ground was the top of my head. I don't remember anything else after that until I woke up with the bike on top of me. And my friend JD, laughing hysterically at what had happened, pulls me up out of the ditch, and as he's standing there looking at me, he's like, I'm like, what? He's like, dude, your head. I was like, what, what about my head? He's like, you got like this huge knot. I had like what looked like an Easter egg underneath my skull protruding outwards. Thankfully, it went out instead of in because who knows what kind of damage that would have caused. But I'm feeling on top of my head. I'm just like, this is not good. This is not good. Like it keeps going further and further. I'm like, well, this is like seriously bad. Like what do we do? Like who do we call? Like what's going on? I'm like 10 years old. And so I say all that to say, That bike did everything that it was intended to do. I was having a blast. But one part didn't function properly, and it led to disaster. If you just build your marriage on passion or high emotion or experiential influence, it will be a fun ride for a little bit. You'll have the time of your life. But the moment you encounter something difficult, the moment you encounter some adversity from life, if it is not built upon the principles of God's word, you're headed for disaster. What is a really, really good and fun thing can all of a sudden leave you holding your head in a dazed and confused state, wondering, what in the world happened? How do I get out of this mess that I'm in? That's why God gives us instructions. And so here in Ephesians 5, Paul lays out what is expected of the husband and wife in marriage. And we would do well to understand these if it's our desire to have lasting, God-honoring marriages. So let's start with you ladies. Let's talk about the responsibilities of the wife. If we go back and look at the first couple of verses In verse 22 through 24, Paul says, Wives, submit to your own husbands, ask the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. So the first responsibility and the primary responsibility of a godly wife is to submit. Now, I want to make sure that we have a good handle on what biblical submission is and looks like. This is another principle that the world has attempted to attack when it comes to godly marriage and divine design. They want to paint submission as being something that's horrifically negative, as if that is the most inferior act that a woman could ever partake in, And that's completely false, the way in which God's Word lays it out. God designed marriage in a way that gives authority to the man. So let's talk about what submission does not mean. Submission, ladies, does not mean that you are inferior. It does not mean that you are insignificant. It does not mean that you are less than. It does not mean that you are somehow a subordinate to your husband or to the man, and we know this because we're all created equal in the image of God. In Genesis 1, verses 26 and 28, God's Word tells us that He made them man and woman, male and female, equally in His image. And so His Word outlines from the get-go that we are equally created in God's image. So biblical submission is not a matter of hierarchy or superiority, or anything like that. It's just the design by which God set up authority within the home and within the marriage. So Paul begins to show us from that point what biblical submission is. And he says, what you need to understand, ladies, is that biblical submission is ultimately done unto Christ. 
So you don't have to make this about a husband and wife, man versus woman type thing. He says, ultimately, your submission is done under Christ. That's why he says in verse 22, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. So ultimately, your submission is done as an obedience thing, first and foremost, unto God by recognizing that this is his design for marriage and how he has set things up to work. At the same time, it's important that you understand that biblical submission is reserved for your husband. It's not expected that you as a lady submit to all men in all places. God's Word doesn't say that either. That's why he goes on to say, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body and is himself his Savior. As the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. This is within the marital context. Your relationship between you and your husband. I think it can be wrapped up like this. Submission is, in essence, a willful deference to the leadership of the husband within the marriage and the home. If you want a good working definition of what biblical submission looks like, there you go. It is looking at God's design for marriage and understanding that this is the context, that he has chosen to set the man in a place of authority, and that if I am going to choose to enter into the covenant relationship that he created and he formed, then I'm choosing to willfully abide by that pattern that he set. Willingly, joyfully doing so. Because I recognize that God has set this up. And he knows best for how it is to function. So ladies, as a godly wife, you submit. And Paul really just leaves it at that. He doesn't give us a whole lot more. Now, don't think that that's all you're getting off with. Because there is a lot more that I think falls underneath the umbrella of submission when it comes to your responsibilities as a godly wife. The second one would be this. You're to be an encouragement. So you submit, but you also encourage. Don't be the kind of wife that discourages everything that your husband does. He don't want to live with that. I'm not trying to be rude, but I have seen countless relationships where the lady is constantly downing the guy that she's with. And you can see the misery all over that poor dude's face. He's like, I can't do nothing, right? Like, I get in trouble even for asking for permission. Don't be that kind of wife that is constantly downing everything that your husband does or suggests as a man, as a husband, if he is seeking to lead you in a godly way, nothing is more defeating than a discouraging wife for him. So it's important that you understand the weight that your encouragement in his life carries. And let me say this, ladies. He should never dread coming home to you. It should be the highlight of his day. It should be the one thing that he looks forward to more so than anything else. And you will be that for him if you are his greatest source of encouragement. If you are constantly uplifting him, that's exactly what he will look forward to each and every day. So you submit, you encourage, but then you support your third responsibility. The literal meaning of being a supportive wife, it, it means to help bear the weight. In other words, it's to, it's to hold up. So it, it gives this image of you as a godly wife, and we see this in Proverbs 31. Some of you may be familiar with that passage. If not, write it down as a reference sometimes. We're not going there tonight. But there are a lot of good characteristics, ladies, that you should be modeling in that passage of what it looks like to be a godly wife. We see a supportive wife in that passage to where she literally holds her husband up. And that's the picture that it shows. Like all the responsibilities, we're going to get to his here in a moment. And all the things that he bears as the leader of the home, the leader in the marriage, the leader of the family, it's a lot of weight to bear. He needs a support system behind him, propping him up in order to be able to lead well in order to be able to serve you well. So you should be his greatest support. A godly wife helps her husband bear the weight of responsibility and leadership that he carries in the marriage and in the home. My wife is the greatest support system that I have, 
hands down. It's not even close. I couldn't make it without her. We had this conversation the other day, like just at random about if something were to happen with either one of us. I was like, something happens to me, like she's going to be fine. She can handle it. She can go on about her life. She can get dressed the next day. She can find food. Something happens to her, hopeless. I have no idea how I would make it through life. Like, I don't know how to get out of bed the next day. I don't know if I can find my way to work. Like, who, who's, who's going to lay my clothes out for me? It's not that bad, but figuratively. Like, I couldn't do anything without that girl. Like, and I don't say that in the sense to paint like an unhealthy dependence kind of thing. I'm just saying that's the kind of support that she brings to my life. Where if she were to be gone, there would seemingly be an unbridgeable gap left. So ladies, if you want to be a, a godly wife, be that kind of support for your husband. Where if something were to happen, if your absence would to become a reality, it would leave a noticeable gap in his life. I don't think any one of you would want to be at a point where you were so low on the support for your husband that if something were to happen, nothing would be missed. Be his greatest system of support. Your next responsibility is you respect. You respect the leadership and decision-making of your husband. Why? Because the decisions that he is making and the leadership that he is providing is being done so with your best interest in mind. Now, that may not always seem to be the case, but if he is following the Lord as he should, then I can assure you that's what he is striving to do. The things that he does, the actions that he takes, the steps that he takes with your household are all being done with your best interest in mind, and he deserves your respect in trying to make those decisions. Don't try to cut his legs out from under him or emasculate him in any way. Men hold respect in very high regard. That's just how God created us, in a sense. Men hold respect in very high regard. And so if they find themselves in the context of a relationship, whether it be a dating relationship or whether it be a marriage, and they feel a constant disrespect, it's going to cause some major, major friction within your marriage. A godly, life, godly wife respects her husband as she keeps it in mind that he is doing the best that he can to lead their family well. And then the last one, I think, goes without saying, you love. You love, you love, you love, you love, you love. I feel like that's pretty self-explanatory. So we're not going to spend a whole lot of time dwelling on that. You submit, you encourage, you support, you respect, and you love. Those are the responsibilities of a godly wife. Now, listen, nowhere in Scripture do we see anything that says the purpose of the wife is to be barefoot, pregnant, and in the kitchen. It's not there. And I understand that that's not the world we live in today anyway, but that's not even a scriptural principle. Proverbs 31 that I referenced earlier, if you want to take a look at that chick, she works her fingers to the bones. So nothing in in Scripture do we see that being the painted picture of what a godly wife is or does. Nor is it just your sole responsibility to buy the groceries or do the laundry or clean the house or wash the dishes. Hear me, man? You can help out with some of that stuff from time to time. You can play a hand in that. It's not just her sole responsibility to do those things. And Scripture doesn't even address those things, as a matter of fact, for the most part. And I'll tell you why. It's because God is more concerned about addressing the character of our marriages over the chores of our marriages. Much rather would he be loving in the way of showing us that these are the characteristics that I want your marriage to exhibit. You figure out the chores. You figure out how to make that work amongst one another. You figure out who's going to pay bills, who's going to cut the grass, who's going to get the garbage can to the street on garbage day, all those things. Who's going to pick the kid up? Who's going to drop the kid off? Like, you figure the ins and outs of those things. Better to have your character set right 
more so than anything else. A good wife, a godly wife, she submits to, she encourages, she supports, respects, and loves her husband. And listen to me, guys. We're fixing to jump on you off for a minute. And she has no problem doing so when you're following the Lord as you should. If these are going to be the responsibilities of our wives, then let's make those responsibilities easy for her to fulfill. In the same sense, ladies, I'm not saying that you have to continue to be submissive or encouraging or supporting or respectful or loving of a man who is not leading you in the footsteps of Christ as he should be. I'm not saying you be disrespectful. I'm not saying you slap him across the face or anything like that. I am saying there may be some times where you need to sit his sorry butt down and let him know, babe, you ain't getting it. This ain't working. You're dragging your feet. You're not leading me towards Christ as you should be. You're not discipling our kids as you should be. You're putting priorities on things that don't need to be prioritized. Like, wake up. I know he's in there. I married you for a reason. I've seen it before. I need that man to come back out again. So, men, in the same sense, if we want our, our wives to be able to, to, to live out their responsibilities, you want a submissive wife? Let her see that you submit to God. You want an encouraging wife? You be an encouragement to her. You want a wife that, that supports you? You be a hard worker. Show her that you're willing to put everything out on the line for your family. You want a wife that respects you? You want a wife that loves you? I'm getting ahead of myself. We'll get to it. Responsibility is the husband. Let's shake them down. This is where we really begin to see how God has set up the, the structure of, of marriage, we get like two verses for the wives, and then we get like nine for the husbands. So let's go back and rehash it. He says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Husbands, future husbands, you are to love your wife as Christ loved the church. So your love for your wife is to be modeled off of Christ's love for his church. Now, that is a crazy, intense, passionate love. One that I have always been intimidated by when it comes to fulfilling my responsibilities as a husband because who can love like Jesus? Who can do that? But these verses that Paul gives us after he calls us to this kind of love being shown to our wives help us see the breakdown of what this kind of love looks like. In other words, guys, you can do this. So let's break it down. I want you to see some, some aspects of your love. You're going to love your wife, which is responsibility number one for you. You love. All throughout these verses that Paul has just given us, we see it time and time again. Love your wife. 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 So the main ingredient, men, in case you did not catch on to the repetitiveness in which Paul was giving it to us, is that you love your wife as Christ of the church. Now let's break down what that looks like a little more intentionally. Well, it looks like this. It looks like you loving her unconditionally. Paul says, love your wives as Christ loved the church. The love that Jesus has for his church is unconditional. There are no standards that you have to meet in order to gain his love, there is nothing that you have to do in his favor to bring about his love into your life. You don't have to convince him to spill out his love over your life. He just loves his bride. 
So men, in the same way, you love your wives unconditionally. She shouldn't have to work to earn your love. She shouldn't have to do anything that's deserving of it, that makes her worthy of it whatsoever. Listen, you, are, are we imperfect, flawed people? Do we screw up? Absolutely. So men, guess what? Your wives are not going to be perfect. They're going to mess up. They're going to do some things that at times make you want to grab her by the shoulders and shake her uncontrollably until something comes loose or gets reconnected. <laughs> Unconditional love says regardless of the mistakes that are made, regardless of the frustrations that are felt, nothing is going to change the desire and the passion and the love that I have for you. You love her unconditionally. She should never feel like she has to do something to gain the love of her husband in her own house. So you love her unconditionally. You love her sacrificially. This is the kind of love that Jesus modeled. Paul goes on to say that Christ loved the church so much that he gave himself up for her. That's a sacrificial love. Jesus was willing and joyfully sacrificed his life for the church. Ultimately, how? Hanging on the cross, literally giving his life for the church. He humbled himself so that we might be exalted with him. So men, love your wife in a way that is self-sacrificial. Learn to lay down some things for the betterment of your wife. Understand going into this that there are some things that you might have a passion for. There are some things that you might enjoy doing. And one of the most difficult things to tell you, men, let me, let me clue you into something. Some of you are going to struggle mightily going into a marriage because you're used to living your life on your terms. You go and do the things that you like to do when you want to do them with whoever you want to do them with whenever you want to do them. And when you get into marriage, guess what? That don't work. Not anymore. I'm not trying to burst your bubble and act like you're going to have a wife that never lets you do anything that you and she's never going to let me go hunting again or fishing again or golfing again or whatever. Like I'm not saying that's going to be the case. What I am saying is you're not going to get to do it as often as you have been doing it for the entirety of your life up until that point. You're going to have to sacrifice some things in order to better your wife, in order to prop up your family. Be willing to love her sacrificially. Be willing to look at all these other things that you might enjoy doing and say, that's great, but she's greater. And I would much rather give up all these things so that she can go do something that maybe she enjoys doing or so that she can see that I prioritize her over my leisure or my bros or whatever else. You love her sacrificially. You give yourself up in a way. You lay down your life. If you, Each and every one of us, listen, I'm, I'm going to speak to y'all like men because hopefully you are men. There's not a man in this room that should call themselves one if they would not literally lay down their physical life for their wife. That's the kind of love you ought to have for the woman that God has brought into your life. You love her sacrificially. You love her spiritually. Paul says that Christ's love for the church was a spiritual one. It says that, that he loved her in a way that he might sanctify her. So Christ and his love for the church ensures that his church will grow in their understanding of him. So how does this relate to us, man? It relates to us in the sense that we are the spiritual leaders of the home. So in the same sense that Christ makes sure that his bride grows in their understanding of him, you make sure that that's happening in your home as well. You look over your wife's spiritual sanctification. You don't cause it, but you help it. Ladies, ultimately, it's your responsibility to pick up the Word of God each and every day and spend your time with Him. It's your responsibility to find time to worship. It's your responsibility to find time to meet with God in prayer. But, man, at the same time, it's your job to check in and make sure that's happening. Now, what this looks like in the context of your marriage may look different than other marriages. Listen, I, some of y'all, some of you ladies, 
feel like you may have this expectation, like, oh, my gosh, they're going to find me a godly husband one day, and it's going to be the greatest thing ever. We're going to sit down at the kitchen table every night. We're going to open up our Bibles. We're going to do, like, this, this deep devo together, and we're going to memorize verses together. We're going to have prayer time together, and we're going to, like, fast together and do all these things. It's going to be amazing. That may not happen at all. I'm going to be honest. In my and Ashley's marriage, it doesn't look like that for us. We don't sit down and have 25, 30 minute devos with one another. Do we check in with, with each other spiritually? Do we pray together? Do we do it as much as we should? No. I'm not going to pretend like we're, we're just, oh, oh. We, you should listen, life, life is life, right? You get busy, you do things. Like, I get that. What I'm saying is, man, like, we have to take the responsibility ultimately to be growing ourselves, but also to check in on our spouse. If you do all those things, if you have Devo times, whatever, that gets established and that's something that y'all do, that's awesome. I'm not discouraging you from it. Go for it. 100% make that happen. If you can, I hope and pray that you can. But if not, the conversations still have to take place. The prayers still have to take place. You have to make sure that you are spiritually guarding your home and edifying your wife. And not just your wife. You see, you. Not. I know this kind of sounds a little weird, but it's not that we use your wife in this sense, but she's practice. Because maybe one day you want to have kids. And then if you're not spiritually edifying your wife, if you're not spiritually building her up, if you're not spiritually protecting her, then how are you going to do that with your kids? And the whole point of this, the two shall become one flesh. When God put Adam and Eve together in the garden, he says, I want you to have a godly union. I want you to live in this covenant relationship, but I want you to do something else too. I want you to be fruitful and multiply. He said, I want you to have kids. Why? Because God desires that we as his people populate this earth with more kingdom builders. How much more is the darkness going to grow if children of light stop burying children of light? Y'all get married one day and have kids. Plop them out. If God so blesses you to have them, have them. Raise them to know God. Teach them the things of the Lord. Man, this ultimately falls upon you to make sure these things happen. Jesus, in, in his word, gave some insight to Paul saying that the reason why he sanctifies his body is because one day he's going to present us to his Father. Now look at the picture of this. One of these days he's going to present us to his father, and he says he will present us in a way where we are holy without spot or blemish. Now that's taking care of your bride spiritually, now ultimately doing that through his sacrificial blood. So men, I firmly believe one day we will stand before God and give an account of how we present our homes to him spiritually. Are they going to be without spot or blemish? Because we took it upon ourselves, the responsibility seriously, to make sure that our homes are places where sanctification can take place. So you love her spiritually. And then you love her provisionally. Paul says that husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. So you take care of and provide for your wife as you do for yourself. You nourish and you cherish. You only have one body, so you make sure you take care of it, right? If you get hungry, what do you do? You go find something to eat. You get thirsty, what do you do? You go find something to drink. You get stinky, what do you do? You go take a shower, hopefully. You take care of your body. Why? Because there's only one you have. Paul says, okay, men. The same way in which you provide, nourish, and cherish your body is the same principle as you apply to taking care of your wife. You make sure that she is taken care of spiritually. You make sure that she is taken care of physically. You provide. You get out and work, gummit. Get a job. Earn a living. Find a house to live in. Provide a, a mode of transportation 
for your wife to drive. And I'm not saying that you've got to have a 3,000 square foot house. You've got to drive around in a 100,000 suburban. Well, I'm not saying any of those things. I'm saying you get out and you provide the best living that you possibly can for your wife and for your family. Take care of her. Paul says do so with such a severity. It's just like you taking care of your own body. So you love and you love and you love and you love and you love. Now I said a couple more. Your next responsibility is you edify. So you physically and spiritually build up your wife. Don't be harsh with or tear down your wife. I see this way too often with men. Men that are way too harsh with their wives. Get way too annoyed, way too easily with their wives that bark at them in public. That is such a disgusting thing when I see it. And so many times I've seen men turn around and just bite the heads off of their wives because of something that they did or didn't do or the way they handled the kids or whatever. That's gross. That's nasty. None of y'all better do that around me and I'll backhand you in the face. Don't do that junk. Don't be harsh with your wife. Don't tear down your wife. You edify. That's the furthest thing from how we saw Solomon treat his bride in their interactions. What was he doing? Constantly edifying her. Constantly affirming her. Constantly encouraging her. Just as Christ edifies his church, you edify your wife. I see a pattern forming in all this, man. All of this is modeled after Jesus. So listen to me. If, if you aren't walking with him, you will have no capacity for fulfilling these responsibilities. Just jot that in on your notes somewhere so you edify her and then you respect her as well I said earlier men hold respect in high regard I feel like each and every one of y'all would agree with me on that but listen to me here respect expected must be respect expressed she deserves it as well if you want to be given respect then you need to show respect for the helpmate that she is that God has given you. So you respect her and you support her. You're not the only one with ambitions. You're not the only one with dreams. You're not the only one with desires. She carries responsibilities as well. Hold her up underneath the weight of the ones that she carries. There are things that your wife may want to pursue career-wise. Most of y'all are going to find yourself in, in marriages like the old way of doing things where the man was a primary breadwinner and the wife didn't work a job or whatever. Those days are kind of faded out. That's kind of the irregularity now. So she's going to work a job. She's going to have a career just like you do one day. Support her and hers just as she supports you in yours. Don't just supersede the things that she desires to go and fulfill or chase after your own. And the last responsibility that I want to hit on is you protect her. You protect your wife. You do whatever you can to guard her heart. You do whatever you can to guard her mind from the spiritual threats that would seek to attack her. But at the same time, you protect her from any and all physical threats that could possibly enter into her life as well. Listen to me. That, that may mean that you have to protect her from her own family. You willing to do that? You willing to step into that role? We all should be. Because I'm going to tell you, guys, like, God put a warrior-like mentality within us that he didn't put within ladies. So they oftentimes don't know when to fight when fighting is what needs to be done. That's when you grab her up underneath the arm and say, I love you, baby. Step behind me for a moment. The men have got to deal with some stuff for a minute. And you handle your business on behalf of your wife. Each and every one of us men should be willing to do so, to protect our wives at all costs. Marriage was created by God to be a reflection of Christ's relation to the church. Ultimately, that's what we see. That's the picture given in Ephesians 5. So you know what that tells me? It tells me that our marriages are to be a picture of the gospel. It's the reason why God treats them so seriously. He gave them to us as a union so that we could enter into it 
in a lost, dark, and dying world around us could look at that union and be drawn to the love, the grace, the mercy, and the forgiveness that's found in Christ and Christ alone. Your marriage should quite literally point people to the Savior. That's why it exists. So these roles and responsibilities of the husband and wife that we find in Scripture, and I want to accentuate this point as we finish out. The world, the world likes to look at biblical marriage and say, that's old. That's old love. That's tired love. That's not the modern day of love. Like love is far more expansive than that. It's far more inclusive than that. This book is, is, is outdated when it comes to relational love. God's word in how it lays out our marriage relationships and the love that we are supposed to express through them and the roles and the responsibilities that we find in it, they're not outdated. They're ideal. It is the standard, the perfect standard of what we are supposed to experience when it comes to seeing the blessings of marriage in its fullness. Just remember, it can't just be the husband fulfilling his role. It can't just be the wife fulfilling her role. It takes two, both of you, 100 in, 100 in, all the time. <laughs>